Welcome to the Dear Katie podcast. This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. And before we get started, I just want to remind our listeners that sometimes the information or the stories told on this podcast can be challenging for anyone, but especially for survivors of violence or survivors of trauma. So please don't hesitate to take a break, take care of yourself, um, reach out to, to a friend or someone to support you um, at some point when you need it. And at the end of the podcast, we will share uh, a website address where you can receive resource information. Today, we are incredibly uh, excited to welcome Laura Davis. Laura has helped me personally before she even knew she was helping me. Um, I wanted to start out, um, Laura, just for our listeners, who are you? And tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Um, My name is Laura Davis. I live in Santa Cruz, California. Um, I have been um, a writer my whole life. I've written both as a way to heal, um, as a way to discover what I was feeling and thinking, um, as a way to process things. And I've also been a public writer. I've I've just published my seventh book. Um, And so I have used words as a way to um, educate to inform, to inspire, um, sometimes to shock or confront. Um, and so I, I've had both a, a, a public uh, experience as a, as a writer and an author. Um, and also, it, it's been a tool that I've used my whole life um, so that I, it's, it's one of the greatest healing modalities for me. So I guess that's, I'm a word person, I guess, is how I want to introduce myself. I love it, Laura. I like I like saying that you're a word person, and today you're going to be a spoken word person uh, because we're going to get to hear your words out loud. And I know our listeners will come along for the journey with you as we talk about your work and your book, and how much um, I'm, I think you're you're going to have so much important advice for our survivors and our supporters. Um, one thing I wanted to add is when I was raped myself and looking for resources and where where to even start my own journey your first book original book really helped me feel not alone and i want to thank you for not even knowing that you were helping with your words on a page and i think that's one of the most important things that you know we're offering to all is there we're never alone and we have to find that courage, that strength to take those first steps and figure out what, you know, what's working, what's not in our healing journeys. So thank you for helping me with mine, Laura. You're welcome. And in that book, just for people who don't know, it was called The Courage to Heal. So it's it's very in keeping with what you're talking about, about the courage necessary to, you know, face the abuse or uh, the violence and to begin the process of healing. And um, when Ellen Bass and I um, began working on that book. Um, I was a 28-year-old incest survivor, um, and she was a writing teacher who was starting to have women come to her writing groups, and they weren't about sexual violence, but women started coming in and like taking little crumpled pieces of paper out of their pocket, and because it was a safe place for people to express, stories of sexual abuse started to emerge. And once one woman told a story, then it was like the floodgates opened. So she was um, working with a lot of writers around the sexual abuse. She had just uh, published the first book of women's stories called uh, I Never Told Anyone. And um, her publisher, um, Harper and Rowe, wanted her to write a book about healing. And um, we ended up teaming up and that book became The Courage to Heal. And it was really the, the first book that mapped the healing process. Because before that, it was kind of like people thought sexual abuse was rare, which of course it unfortunately wasn't. And also it was like, this happened to you and your life is ruined. And there there was no information about what you could do other than be a statistic. And so I think the the Courage to Heal has had a, a pretty incredible life for over 30 years, 33 years now. And you know, I hate to say, but it has helped generations of survivors. And when the book first came out, I think Ellen and I were quite naive. We had this idea, if we just talk about it and bring it to people's attention, it will stop. Um, and unfortunately, that has not been the case. Um, I know Claire is going to get you started on your next book. But before we leave your past work, Laura, I think first what I hear is timeless. 
you are not only helping generations, but you know, you helped me start my 30 year last journey, last 30 years of journey myself. So thank you. And all the things you, I think that book is still relevant. I think we want people to read your next work, of course, which we're going to talk about, but I think, you know, it's, it's historic, but it's also still a hundred percent relative re- relevant to today. So thank well, you. We kept, you know, we kept updating it because, um, so much has been learned about trauma and the healing of trauma in this these decades. So, you know, we we would do a new edition and we would include more about somatic healing, healing in the body, or we would include more about trauma in the brain and, and new research on memory and new stories. Um, so we, we really tried to keep the book up to date. Uh, but the, the core message is really the same, which is you're not alone healing is possible, and you will not always be in the kind of pain you're in right now. Um, And and that you you have the courage to do this and that here's the steps you need to take. And that that, that kind of core message has not changed. That's true. And I, you know, I don't know any therapist uh, who works with survivors, which is really technically most therapists, but some don't know it, um, who doesn't have that book on their shelf. I mean, it's, it's, um, I had a copy in, in my office um, at the University of Virginia, and I, I had to, you know, it would disappear. So then I'd have to read <laughs> I've heard that story so many times. It, you know? <laughs> um, but our, the counselors also had it, you know, so it really is an essential um, book to have in your library if you are a survivor or a person who provides mental health counseling or support to survivors, really. So, um, and with that... Um, I think it would be nice to kind of move into to talking about this new work of yours. Uh, you just published it, this memoir, A Burning Light of Two Stars, which I literally finished reading about 25 minutes ago. It's so hard not to stop. It's so hard to stop. I mean, it really was. I just read it continuously. Um, and it really, the, the, the years between Courage to Heal and now the publication of this book, so much has happened for you. And this book, um, Burning Light of, of Two Stars, really kind of documents all that change. Um, but you call it a, a both a prequel and a sequel. And I'm wondering what you mean by that. Well, for one, the, the new book, um, well, it's a, it's a memoir. You know, the, the other, this is my seventh book. And the, the other ones have all been like kind of how to do something. So they're more information-based. And this is a really personal, intimate story. And it reads like a novel. I mean, I wrote it as a story. And you maybe will get some information from it or some inspiration, but really, I want you to be caught up in the story. Um, And it, it, for one, it reveals some of the early history of The Courage to Heal, how that book came to be. Um, And also, after it was published, and it became very visible, and it became like a a talisman um, for survivors, they would you know, carry it around. They would put it under their pillow. They would, I mean, I, we just heard amazing stories about people's relationship, just even with the physical book, it meant so much to them. And as women became more empowered, um, there started to be a giant backlash. And um, and Ellen Bass and I, as the co-authors of that book, the most visible book, uh, were the targets of that backlash. So that's, that's um, those are things I've never written or spoken of publicly before. So those are some small threads in this memoir. Um, I think the story, this story really, it goes back to, you know, what happened to me when I was a child. Um, and then it also was like, what happened in the years after The Courage to Heal uh, was published? And um, this story focuses on my relationship with my mother, um, who, uh, when I told her about the sexual abuse I think like many uh, parents, unfortunately, said it hadn't happened and basically that I was making it up to destroy her. And uh, we had a huge rift that occurred in my late 20s over this. And then the fact that I you know, wrote The Courage to Heal and was very public as a survivor, as an advocate, as a speaker for years, um, just made the, the uh, estrangement between us much worse. And so, you know, this story really focuses on that relationship, and it looks at what is it like to heal from trauma, not just in the short term, which is really more what we talked about in The Courage to Heal was the kind of the white 
hot heat of the healing process in the beginning, but what does it look like after 20 years? What does it look like after 30 years? Um, and for me personally, and I'm not saying this is right for anyone else, part of that process as the decades went by um, involved a reconciliation with my mother and coming to peace with that relationship. And I actually um, ended up taking care of her at the end of her life. And that's one of the big questions that this book explores and that I had to explore is, is it possible to become a caregiver for someone who betrayed you in the past? All of our survivors, when we start talking about reconciliation, there's so many people and or entities with whom we as survivors need to reconcile or think about what that relationship that we find uh, soul sitting, uh, sits well with our soul, right? I think the thing I want to say, especially because I'm going to talk about how I did engage in this reconciliation process, I really want to say to everyone listening today is this is not for everyone. Um, and that um, you will be pressured both externally, you know, by family members um, or internally inside yourself, like that you have to reconcile, that you have to make peace, that you have to forgive. And for me, you know, and we said this really strongly in The Courage to Heal, and I have not changed one iota in 35 years since we wrote it, is the most essential forgiveness is with yourself, that you have to forgive yourself for any way you are still carrying any shred of responsibility for what happened, you know, any way you are blaming yourself, um, either for what happened to you or the ways you responded to it or the the coping um, skills that maybe have not been so healthy. Um, that's really the most essential thing. And I, I think, you know, for me, the, the question of reconciliation, regardless of who it's with, is not in the early stages of the healing process, although people will push you um, to do it, you know, and because they want it all to go away. Uh, but the reality is that we have to deal with our own healing first. The only way that I was um, able to begin to even think about reconciling with my mother is that I set very clear boundaries and separation from her. Because when I was in the throes of my healing process in the, the most difficult, challenging years, I couldn't have her denial, her rage, um, her anxiety, you know, right there in my head all the time. I needed to create a safe environment to heal. And that meant creating a community of people who would support my healing process and not be denying it or telling me I should get over it or it happened in the past. Why don't you just let it go already? Um, so, you know, I think anyone who is talking to you like that, um, just don't listen to them. I love your empowering statement. It's, it's you're told you're saying it's totally your choice, right? But I fear that some of our survivors have come to us and said, but my faith, my God, my belief system, my, how do we reconcile that to pressing in upon us to, and you said, we don't have to go at a certain rhythm and cadence. You're saying go at your own pace and we don't have to get it done in one week. But I fear that the next time someone goes to their house of worship or the next time someone sees their perpetrator in a class, you know, there's, it presses in. So maybe how do we, uh, maybe I turn it around and say, how do we press back out as survivors about not going with the forced rec reconciliation, right? How do we press back? I think you need to develop um, a support system of people who are there for you. And that is not their agenda, is to push you in a particular direction. Um, any kind of forced reconciliation or forced forgiveness um, is going to undermine your healing. That, that's what I would say, you know, um, from my decades of experience. Um, you know, I think that I have, I have actually forgiven my perpetrator, who was my grandfather, but, it, you know, it wasn't something I tried to make happen. I really put him out of my mind, and I really focused on my own healing process. And m for me personally, anyway, my experience of forgiveness was that it was 
kind of an unexpected gift. It was a byproduct of me focusing on my own healing. And that um, it, it only came after I fully expressed my anger, my grief. Um, my, I broke silence. I told my story repeatedly. Um, I became empowered and I began to take my life back so that I was no longer, uh, my life was no longer a reflection of what had happened to me. You know, I began to, um, the, the abuse no, in, was no longer in the forefront of my life, which it was for many years. It was like my primary identity. It began to recede because I had done my healing work. And that was the point at which this possibility for me um, came up of uh, reconciliation and forgiveness. So, you know, I, I understand that it's hard, um, but I don't think, I, I'm not going to encourage people to try to push to make it happen because I don't think that's the healthy choice. I was thinking as you were talking, I'm thinking about um, how it's, it. I, I resonated with that idea that one has to be at a, a place in life where you've are able to where you're healed to the point where now you can look back and maybe consider. And it, I liked how you said it was a forgiveness was a byproduct, you know, forgiving your grandfather. I think so many times survivors are, as Katie was saying, that's the first thing that people say, well, you have to forgive them. And then you've hardly even started the healing process. And and I, I'm even thinking of a larger scale, like the truth and reconciliation commissions, where you have people who've experienced horrific human rights violations and torture and all kinds of stuff. And they're told, okay, you tell your story and then it'll be okay. You know? <laughs> and I'm thinking, right, that doesn't work very well. I mean, nice, nice idea. You know, the people aren't, people need to go through their own healing process. And, and on an individual level, what you're saying seems really rings true for me. And what I'm hearing from, when I hear from survivors, you know, I've heard over the years, the many years I've been doing this work that it really, you got to focus on yourself and take care of yourself and do what you need to heal. And all those outside voices saying, you know, get over it or forgive or whatever it is that you need to do. We can't, you know, we can't follow their agenda. We have to follow our own. And, and to that end, I sort of want to know, you know, I mean, you process this reconciliation, you, you talk about this reconciliation process with your mother in your book. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it took me what three hundred and forty pages to describe it, but um, it, it's it was a very complicated process. As I said at first, uh, what I needed more than anything was to set boundaries and to separate. You know, I needed to. She was, you know, for my early life, she was such an overwhelming force, and in some ways, I would say that uh, my relationship with her. Um, created much more of a core wound for me than anything my grandfather did. I'm, I'm not minimizing the fact that I'm an incest survivor, but for me, um, the, the, the more devastating wound uh, was with my mother um, than it was with she him. She seemed like such a and force to be reckoned with. Just incredible she was an, force. Yeah, an incredible force. She was like the, um, the sun, and I was supposed to be in her orbit. And, you know, the problem is she gave birth to another son. Um, so w we were really at odds um, for a, a really long time uh, before the sexual abuse came to the surface. I found that the the stages of your mother's life almost matched in a way the shifts for you. I, I, maybe I'm misreading it, but every time something happened about her that you had to deal with, you were then for forced to confront your own feelings about her again in a different way. Am I, am I, was I reading that correctly? And that, that also was sort of sometimes it was a problem, but, but sometimes it was also something that pushed you to deal with certain issues that you were sort of avoiding, especially when she moved to Santa Cruz and, and you were helping her. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we achieved when, when um, I had a son uh, when I was 36 years old and then I had a daughter uh, a few years later and I already had a stepson who was 11 at that time. So I have three kids. Um, and when I was pregnant, I think that was a big motivator uh, for me and for my mother um, 
And and the reason is that I had observed her with my niece um, and that she was actually a good grandmother. You know, and I'm not saying there may be people listening where you would not want your parents anywhere near your children, and that would absolutely be the right decision. Um, but for me, I saw that there were aspects of her that I actually wanted in my son's life. And she very much wanted to be his grandmother. And I think that um, desire, on, it was on both our parts, I think really helped us start to move a little bit closer. And, you know, th- one of the things my mother and I did, and this is one form, you know, I think when we think about reconciliation, I think that's kind of an important thing to talk about that I think we have this idea, at least I did, um, that it was going to be this huge, dramatic coming together. Everything would be on the table. Everything would be acknowledged. There would be violins playing. There would be this forgiveness. There would be this you know, incredible connection. Um, and the relationship would either renew intimacy or become intimate for the first time. And what I discovered um, in the process of going through this myself and then also studying it because I I wrote a book about 20 years ago called um, uh, I Thought We'd Never Speak Again, which is about the process of reconciliation. And uh, what I learned is that that type of full-blown, 100% renewed relationship is the rarest form um, that reconciliation can take. Um, and so it's it's something we maybe want, but it's very difficult to achieve. And it absolutely takes both people. Um, The second type is where one person, in this case, it would be me, um, changes their perspective and is able to see the relationship differently, even if the other person doesn't make significant changes. Like, for instance, I think one of the things that influenced me over the years was I began to look at my mother's life um, from a, a, a vaster vantage point. So I started looking at the fact that the grandfather who was my perpetrator was her father. Um, I started looking at the fact that she grew up extremely poor in an immigrant family um, and and felt a huge amount of shame growing up because of that poverty. Um, I looked at the realities for women of her generation. Um, You know, she was the only person in her family to ever go to college, for instance. Um, And she, I started to actually admire her. Like for someone of her generation, she achieved so much, you know, and, and so I started seeing her from a different vantage point, not just as this impenetrable obstacle to me, my mother, but I started looking at her as a daughter, as a granddaughter, as a sibling, um, as a, she was a social worker, um, as a friend. And I just saw her from a different point of view. Um, and I was able to see that she was more than the impediments between us. Um, and we ultimately, um, we did what I call agreeing to disagree. You know, I, I really wanted her to acknowledge what had happened to me. She really wanted me to recant. And we both were completely locked into our points of view. And But as I healed more and as I began to be more focused on my contemporary life and I didn't need to be focused on healing from trauma anymore. I didn't really need that from her anymore. Like I just realized that she wasn't capable and that she she ironically she had given me a certain amount of strength and courage as her daughter that enabled me to face the sexual abuse that she herself could not face. And so I I felt some compassion for her. And I and she gave up trying to get me to recant. And we, what we agreed to do was basically set it aside, um, and to begin to find other avenues of connection. And they were often little things like cooking together, or going to the movies together, or you know hanging out with the baby together, or things that enabled us to have more in our relationship than just twenty years of war between us. And that's really how our reconciliation began. But it seems to me that, um, and this is what I know that in large part what you're saying in this memoir and also what you're saying today is that you have to have you have to have had the opportunity to do a good deal of healing before you could even see those other parts of her. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, it is it it the healing has to come first. And I think for I I did meet one woman. It was interesting when we did the last 
um, update of the Courage to Heal, I did interview a woman. Um, she was, I forget, she, it was some Asian background, but in her culture, you would never consider separating from your family. It's just like not in their culture. And she, it, she was a Pacific Islander and she had, she had done her healing process while still living in the family home. And I, I thought that was kind of impossible, but she actually had been very successful with it. And we, we had a really interesting conversation. And that was just one of those times where I thought, okay, I thought that this was necessary, but maybe that's really just a cultural uh, belief that, you know, separation and autonomy is what is required. And in her case, she she certainly protected her healing process from her relatives, but she continued to connect with them the whole time. It was a pretty interesting story. Um, but, you know, my experience has been that I needed, I needed to focus on my own healing and I needed to do it for many years. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, you talked about um, how your feelings about this have changed, your relationship with the mother obviously has changed. What is it like? Because your mother wasn't the only person in your family who was reacting to that news. And it, it you know, it's like a ripple effect when someone, you know, comes out for you know, lack of a better term, as a as a survivor of a trauma that happened within the family. What is it like when to be to be estranged from your family. I mean, because people are responding and they want you to do things. We talked about that, you know, reconciliation prematurely. But when people are responding in ways that you don't want, even your brother's response to you, which was not to um, deny it, but his response was not helpful, you know, and then your aunts and uncles and all the people in your family. What's it like to be estranged from a, a close-knit family? You know, someone someone said to me, they said, and I, I think this is really a good description, they said, it's like having a rotten tooth. It gnaws at you all the time. Um, and there there was another quote that I, I used once uh, in my writing. It was by someone named Jean de la Broyere, and it was, to endeavor to forget someone is a certain way of thinking of nothing else. So, you know, I I was obsessed with them when I was estranged from them. And I I really felt the um, rejection. And I, I, I remember feeling just like this little speck of dust floating around the universe by myself, you know. But I actually had incredible friends. Um, and I really created a chosen family. And those people are still the closest people to me. Um, my father, my parents were divorced, and my father was really supportive. When I came and told him um, what had happened, because it was his father, his ex-father-in-law, and he just looked at me, he said, I always thought he was a bastard. So that was like the best response I could have gotten. And my dad continued to really support me um, through the courage to heal and through all the choices and changes I went through. And my brother was like wishy-washy, and I, I just was pissed off at him, and it really created. Um, and, and not only that, my brother was like a new age person. So he would say things like, uh, we choose our parents and um, you, you must have needed this to grow. And I would just be irate. I would be so pissed at him. And I I, I don't, you know, and he and I are, are I would say are close now, uh, but the, it still rubs me the wrong. He still believes that, but I just we just don't talk about it. I mean, we've we've made other ways of connecting, and he and I are not going to see eye to eye on a lot of things. But he's the last member of my nuclear family who's alive, and I really value him. But it's taken a lot of years to work on that relationship with my brother. And you know, I had a bunch of cousins, and you know, all the other relatives who abandoned me. Um, when I when I started to reconcile with my mother, they came back into my life, but definitely in a, a distant way. Like I wouldn't say that I was intimate with any of those people. You know, they were like I could be at a family gathering with them and feel relaxed. You know, I didn't feel have to feel uptight or on tender hooks. But I never these people never got to really know me on the inside. I mean, it was a pretty superficial relationship, and I ultimately you know value them because. I don't know why, but I, I mean, I do, but I'm not, they're not the people I really trust in the deepest way. The people I trust in the deepest way are the people who were there for me when I was going through this decades ago. And and they're the ones who really are kind of have access to my inner sanctum. 
And I think I've learned that you have different levels of relationship with different people. And when I was younger, it was like all or nothing, you know, either you're out or you're in, either you have completely betrayed me, you know, or you're in my camp. And I, I just see things as more complex now than I did then. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that the, the process of healing and the stages one goes through that ability to understand nuance and complexity in relationships with people who may have not been supportive in the past. Um, it's kind of a natural outgrowth of that. It, it, am I, does that seem yes, right Yes, I to think you? for, well, for me, it, it has been a natural outgrowth. Um, it's just, I've lived longer. Life is complicated. I've watched the ways that I have failed people. Uh, you know, I just, life is more complicated. People are, living is hard. Uh, and I became a parent. It really changed my perspective on parenting and how hard it is. And I had a lot more resources uh, than my mother did uh, when she was a parent. And, um, you know, one thing we're always talking about, the types of reconciliation. And there's one other thing that I think is possible sometimes. And like, let's say you're in a situation where you're, you have relatives that you, you're never going to be close to them, or at least you can't imagine ever being close to them Um and, you know, there's a huge rift of some type. Maybe it's around the sexual abuse. Maybe it's around politics. Maybe it's around something else. Um, but let's say you all want to go to the same wedding, you know, or the same event. And I think in those situations, um, it can be possible um, sometimes, not always, um, with a really skilled therapist or facilitator to uh, bring both sides together and come up with some what I call um, terms of engagement and it could be something like, you know, you might say, well, I'll come to the wedding, but I'm not sitting at the family table, you know, or I'm not taking any family pictures or, you know, I'm not hugging dad or um, I'm going to come, but I'm not staying with you, you know, or, or I'm going to come and you are not allowed to talk about my weight or tell stories about what a difficult teenager I was. So I think we can set certain ground rules and sometimes there might be some coming from the other side. And you can't be guaranteed that the things you're asking for will be respected. But if they're not, it gives you more information to work with. You know, it's like more grist for the mill. And maybe you realize, you know, I can't even do that. Or maybe it was like, that went better than I thought it would. It really wasn't so bad. Can I just ask one, because I'm trying, again, always to be in the shoes of our all of our listeners. What should they do or what do you what do you think they should do in the moment? I think you have to pay attention to your body first. Like n know your own signals to know that something doesn't feel right. Um, because I think sometimes uh, those of us who have been uh, uh, sexually abused, we just go into freeze mode, you know, and we just freeze. Um, so I think I think you need an escape plan. You know, you need to have a plan ahead of time. If this does not go well, then I'm going to respond in this way. You know, I'm going to walk out. I'm going to leave. I'm going to have a, a plane ticket that's not um, where I can just get to the airport and get the hell out of there. Um, you can go out and you have someone that you could call, you know, a therapist or a friend that you could talk through what's going on. Um, you know, I, 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 you, could, you could bring a friend with you, you know, so that you have an ally right there. Um, but, but you don't, like if, if someone breaks that agreement, then you don't have to be there anymore. And uh, I, what I hear you saying, Laura, is you also don't have to try again. Say, "Hey, you broke the rule. Do you remember what you agreed to? Don't don't engage." What do you, What do you think about engagement? Because what you just listed were ways to leave. Um, but some of our our folks may say, "I I want to engage," or that riles me up. I need to, you know, go into a screaming match with them. I need to tell them, is it better in your experience to leave or what are you thinking? Um, I think there's, there's not one answer to that. I think, you know, before going into any situation like this, it's really important to practice and to start thinking about like, what is the best outcome and what is the worst outcome? And I wouldn't even go unless you knew you could live with the worst outcome. Like if the worst thing that would happen would be X, you know, could I live with that? That's the first thing. And then, and then, and then talking through um, what you might do and, you know, actually role playing it and play acting it, you know, like if this happens, trying different things. And, um, 
you know, I think inevitably we're going to make mistakes. We might, you know, but what I think the way I look at it is that whatever happens Afterwards, you can go home and you can look at what happened. You can understand what happened, and it could it could ha- help you make better boundaries and decisions the next time. And you know, the decision might be that went better than I thought. I'm going to take another calculated risk, or it might be that was a disaster. I'm not going to try that again. And you know, when I used to go visit my mother, I would come home and I would feel like I had to lick my wounds for months. Like, I would feel so devastated. It would take me a long time to recover. Um, and I, I, but I, you know, then I would, a year later, I would try it again. I, I, it took me a long, there was, there was this one woman I interviewed for Courage to Heal, and I, I never forgot her. And, and because our, our situations were quite similar, um, because my mother and I had a really um, in-depth correspondence And that's one of the threads in the memoir, these letters that we sent back and forth, even when we were estranged. And this woman said that she would, um, she and her mother wrote really nice letters to each other. Like on the page, they did really well. There was something about the distance of letter writing and you don't have to face the other person. You don't have to respond in real time. You're in, in your own protected environment responding. You can write drafts and throw them out and think through what you're going to say. So it's, it's not a real time engagement. And she said they would write letters and then she would think, Oh, I'm going to go visit my mother. And she would go. And and within a couple hours, the whole thing would be a disaster. She would be devastated. Um, she would go home, she would take her a long time to recover. And then she and her mother would start writing letters again. And after about six months or a year of letters, she think, well, maybe, you know, cause the letters, were felt good. And she'd think, well, maybe it won't be so bad the next time. And she would go back again. And then the same thing would repeat. And she said she went through it year after year after year. And she said, one day, I just realized I'm not visiting anymore because the only mother I have is a mother in letters. Like this is the extent of the relationship we could have. And I'm not going to keep putting myself in that situation anymore. This has been the best. Uh, you're amazing. And I'm I'm still still so enamored and honored to have you on this you know journey with our survivors. You've you know told us your mental journey, but not always I'd love to hear about your physical care. You've said therapy, you know, but we've been in our podcast we talk a lot Laura about baths and sitting on the beach and some stuff that's just like the rhythm and cadence of my oxygen and my food. We've talked about chocolate when one of our survivors throws axes. Like I, I just want to dig in on that part of your journey. Yeah. No, no. She's amazing. Oh my she God. She does. She goes she, into the woods and throws she, axes. She just, she's a guru <laughs> of axe throwing in the forest. Um, so I, that was part one, and I'm sorry to give you two, but one is, you know, you talked about words on the page. We we often talk about journaling, which I, I'm hearing you speak to as well, but what other um, ways can our survivors find that healing journey? And then the only other flip side to that, if if you want me to parse it out, but that's one, is like the the five sensory physical every day, what, what helps. And then the other one would be last. I I really want us to talk about anger because there's anger on two fronts. There's anger. This sometimes I feel like Laura, our, our survivors don't get angry enough. And I, I think you, that was part of your journey. And I'd love to hear you speak about anger because I, I think all of us need to get through anger and feel like we're worth being angry. Okay, so I, I'll start with the anger. And yeah, I just want to yeah. say for anyone listening that I am incredibly pissed off about what happened to you. I am angry on your behalf and that you can lean on my anger and take some of it for yourself. It, it never should have happened. And Anger and rage are an essential part of the healing process. If you don't get your anger out, and for me, I really resisted it for a long time, it frees everything. I mean, it is such an essential part is to be able to get angry on your own behalf 
um, and to know you were valuable enough that this never, ever should have happened to you. And I think, you know, I, I was afraid of my anger for a long time. I thought it would um, consume me. Um, but actually it didn't, it empowered me. And I think anger is, is one, uh, tool that really empowers you to move through the healing process. Um, and it's, it's really, really important. And it, it's not like you're going to be in a state of rage for the rest of your life. Um, but, um, if you don't express that anger and find a safe place to do it, whether it's in the woods (laughs) <laughs> or, you know, pounding pillows at a therapist's office um, or, you know, writing out a manifesto, um, it will destroy you. Um, unexpressed anger leads to so much illness um, and and um, so much devastation, so much turning in on ourselves. And so it is really a critical part of the healing process. That chapter on anger in The Courage to Heal is one of the strongest and most important chapters. So I want to say that anger is essential, as is grief. And they're often closely tied together. You know, you start to touch into the grief about what happened to you when you were a child or when you were a young adult or whenever it happened or how many times it happened. Um, and then the rage is often right there. Um, and we we really need both. They They power us through the healing process. Um, I think self-care is, you know, different for everybody. I mean, for me, like I, this morning, I, I have a puppy, an 11 month old uh, yellow lab pandemic puppy. And uh, my, my wife and I uh, just went for like a long tromp in the woods, in the redwoods. We live out in California. We went walking for a few hours with the, with the puppy. And that for me was like, it just, you know, just letting all that chlorophyll coming into my being, moving my body. Uh, so for me, nature is incredibly important um, and physical exercise. So I'm a swimmer um, and I love to hike and those things are really important. And when I don't do them, I notice that um, my anxiety starts to increase and, you know, I feel more stressed and I'm not coping or functioning as well. So for me, physical activity um, and nature are are two of the really important things. And I think, you know, we each have our, and writing, writing has been a go-to my entire life. Um, I wanted to tell people that I have a, um, an ebook that I created that I think would be perfect for this group. Um, it's a, a, and you should get a pen or something so you could write this down. Um, but I have it up on my website. It's free and it's called Writing Towards Courage, a 30-day practice. And it teaches the basics of a certain kind of journaling called writing practice. And then there's like 30 prompts with like quotes or poems or things to get you writing. And it's all focused on developing your own courage. So I think it would be great um, for this group. And um, if you want to download it, um, you could go to uh, www.lauradavis.net slash courage. Uh, lauradavis.net forward slash courage. Um, and that's a, it's a great free tool um, that will help you if, if, and you don't have to consider yourself a writer to use it. You could use it, you could use the prompts in a discussion group or a survivor's group, um, or you can just write them, but you don't have to feel like you are a writer. It's just a tool for healing um, that I'd like to offer everybody. Thank you for that, Laura. Um, in fact, I was hoping you find an opportunity to let people know about that resource um, because it's, it's really wonderful. I've already downloaded it. And um, as a person who's a procrastinating writer, so I really appreciated that. So once again, thank you to Laura Davis for, um, for being our guest today. And um, in addition to her website and the resources there about writing and writing for healing, you can visit takebackthenight.org for Uh, other sorts of support resources and information about our legal support hotline. So um, just remember that there are so many avenues out there in the world for healing and you are not alone. We are not alone. And our guest today is, is a perfect example of how healing can take many shapes and many forms. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Laura. And onward, upward to all of our survivors, our supporters, those who journey with us each week on the Dear Katie podcast. 
together we shatter the silence and we end the violence. Thank you, thank you. So long, everyone.